for a couple more people to join us. Um, but yes, we are live today for a very uh, special workshop that I'm very excited about. Uh, where I'm going to talk about my dear friend here, Push, that's right next to me. Uh, and right now, you're going to probably see three different windows. You're going to see me over here. Hi. Uh, 343 Labs, there's our wonderful logo. Uh, and then you also have Ableton Live in front of you. It's purple, uh, but it is live for anyone who's curious about it. Uh, and then you have Push right here, over here with me. So I'm just going to give a quick shout out to anyone who might be watching now in the chat. Let's check out the YouTube page and see how it's going. We're also streaming to different platforms. So if you if you haven't heard of us doing this before, it's because we are we've been recently doing a lot of um, live stream related type things. So I'm actually going to type into the chat and say hello uh, because we're we're all currently here. That was the chat on YouTube. Uh, and yeah, really excited to do this. I also want to give a shout out to Thomas, who's running things behind the scenes, which is awesome. Uh, and yeah, very, very excited to commence with sharing some stuff. So maybe we should, should we wait a little longer for people to join us? Actually, no, while we're waiting, uh, we won't wait though on talking about 343 Labs itself. So 343 Labs is an institution that's uh, based in New York. We mostly are active in Manhattan. And for most part, we were active in person before the current COVID lockdown. Uh, but we've been very fortunate that we've been able to move a lot of our programming online, which has been really great. Uh, so uh, now most of our classes that you'll find are online. So if you want to head over to 343labs.com, you'll be able to find additional information about the online course offerings that we have. We mainly do courses that are two-day workshops or five-day intensives. And we also have 12 week or 12 lesson long courses that are either once a week or at different variations in different weeks. Uh, so anyone who's watching, if you want to type into the chat, give us a shout out, give us a hello and let us know that you're there. I will be asking people um, at different points in the night to kind of like give us some suggestions from the chat, if you will. Um, just because I think it's, it's great to be able to produce music, not just um, like we are now, you know, in, in the comfort of our homes, but also with each other. So anyone who's in the chat on YouTube uh, or on Twitch, um, I'm watching the YouTube chat. I believe Thomas is watching the others as well. Um, Thomas from Theodore the Labs, that is. So if you want to drop in uh, any key that you like, so it could be C major or it could be F sharp minor or it could be any of these. If you want to drop that in the YouTube chat, go for that. And also if you want to drop in a BPM, a tempo into the YouTube chat, you can also put that in. So I'm just going to wait um, and see if anyone puts it in. Maybe I'll give it a minute or so. If I don't get any suggestions, uh, we'll see what we can do. We're going to make the best out of things. But I hope everyone's been doing great. And just to give everyone, put everyone on the same page with this, what we're dealing with today is, is push. And push is this thing that I have over here right next to me. Uh, personally speaking, it's been one of my best friends in a way for a lot of music making type things. Um, and you can use it for a ton of things. You can use it for MIDI sequencing and you can also use it for a lot of audio related stuff. And oftentimes when we think of electronic music, we think of these two, two types of signals. We have MIDI and then we have the audio. Um, ooh, thank you, Andrew Bowers, for 110 BPM. I think we're still looking for a key. Hello, Bug Tank. Uh, Alexander, thank you. So we have a key and we have um, a tempo now. Anyone want to give a scale, like if it's major or minor? Let's stick to either major or minor for now. Uh, if there are no suggestions, we'll maybe we'll like assume minor, but I'll just wait and see if anyone's in agreement with me for minor. But in the meantime, I'm going to show you the first thing that you can do from push, which is basically set a tempo. And there's a knob on the top left-hand corner of push over here uh, that says, it's it, the label underneath it says tap tempo. But another thing you can do is turn the knob. And if we look in live, in the corresponding top left-hand corner of Ableton Live, you'll be able to see the tempo shift. And you will also see this change correspondingly on push. So push is telling me, okay, now I'm at 111. Now it's 110. Great. So now we have that. F major. Thank you, Carolyn Awesome. Uh, and Alexander as well. So this is the second thing you can do from push. You are able to change the key directly from push. And the way we do that is with a button over on the right-hand side that's called scale. The way you need to see scale, though, first is if you have a MIDI track. Um, this is an example of what a MIDI track would look like if you pulled it up on push. Of course, right now, if I play anything, we won't hear anything. And that's because we don't have an instrument on it yet. We will soon, so please stay tuned. Uh, but we want to make sure that we can set the scale. So I'm going to press the scale button right over here. And it's going to immediately give me a slew of options that I can choose from. So as you can see, the current key is selected, 
We know that we are in C and we are in major, so that's why this little highlighted section of push is lit up. So we want to stay in major, we won't touch this, but the idea is that you would be able to use these knobs at the top of push over here to navigate between the different types of scales you wanted. And you could even choose um, different types of scales like Dorian, or uh, I believe there's also pentatonic scale, so all of, all of these different options. What I want to look for now though is the note that is called F, and ah, there, there's F over here. So now if I press on this soft button over here directly below the section, our key is going to become F major. Um, and we'll leave it there for now. What we want to do is exit out of scale mode. And again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put that into any of the chats that we're on. You can put it into um, the YouTube chat or the Twitch chat or any other chat, like I said. So let's see if we can get something started. I think it would be interesting to, before we actually start you know, working with audio, let's build us some context. Because it's one thing to be working with audio and just like playing around with it. Uh, but how do we work with audio in a relevant way? We make sure that we are first um, creating something that's you know, relevant to the music that we want to make. So what I'm going to do over here in live um, is instantiate some different kinds of instruments on um, these different types of tracks. So on this MIDI track right now, what I will do is add a device to it. So maybe some kind of a uh, piano or a synth pad. And I think I have something in mind. So I'm going to head over to add device and I'm going to head over to my collections, which is something that you that is new in Ableton Live 10 for anyone who's coming over from a later version of Live. And this basically lets you put in uh, some of your favorite things that you'll be able to pull up in Live. So let me see if I have it over here. I have several different versions of Live, so it may or may not be <laughs> in this version. No, that's not, it's not, that's okay. So what I'm trying to actually do is search for a particular sound, and I would like it to be a piano type of sound. So I'm going to head over to the piano category, piano and keys in the sounds section. And now, as I start scrolling through all of these, I get a preview of different types of sounds. Well, that, look, that sounds all right, so I'm gonna pick that. And now, when I'm playing around in Ableton Live on push, I'm able to play different types of chords, like a minor chord, for example. different type of chord, uh, but all of these are in the key of F major. Well, actually, it looks like we're in F minor. Oh dear, let me check. And yes, I accidentally pressed something. Let's switch that back to major, and now we have a major chord. This is F major, everybody. Yay, cool. And hi, everyone who's tuning in to the YouTube chat. Just checked in. We have some more people popping in, so welcome, welcome. Now we always, okay, so now we have our F major. Let's also pull out of this. So I'm going to exit scale mode. And what I want to do is maybe add some kind of, hmm, some kind of drum part to this. So let's add another track to this. I'm going to put it before the electric piano track that I have. I'm going to hit add track. It's going to again be a MIDI track, but this time let's pick some drums. And let's pick, uh, let's see, lots of options. Ooh. Yeah, let's actually pick this. It's a funky 707 type thing. So now on push, it's going to load up a kit for me. Ooh, that's a little bit hot. A great thing we can also do from push is decrease the volumes of these. So I'm going to bring this a little bit down so that we're not killing our ears, which is always good to protect your ears. Uh, it's very important, can't get your hearing back. So still a little bit harsh. And here's a tip actually for adjusting levels. Usually if you're working with a kit or any type of um, you know instrument that has multiple different kinds of sounds, a really great way of establishing uh, what the appropriate volume might be at a given time is to find the quote unquote loudest sound and then adjust the volume from there. So for example, cool. The, the, this side stick and this clap are a little bit harsh, so I'm going to adjust until the level there sounds good. Cool, and this way I'm like not overwhelming myself with all of the sound. Similarly, going to bring this down a little bit more. Great, so we have our tempo. We have 110 BPM and F major. Let's see if we can program in some drums for now. Now, the great thing about Ableton Push is that the moment you start putting things into what we call the step sequencer section here, of push, uh, we can immediately start creating a loop. So let's do that. So there we go. 
We can also start layering in sounds and we can also make duplicates of these clips so that we're continuously building on a loop. And I can do that by hitting the duplicate button over here on the left of push. So I'm gonna do that and live will say, duplicate it to new scene uh, on the display over here. I'm also gonna switch back to device view. Great. So in this, I, I would like to add on some, some claps perhaps. Great, so let's duplicate this scene again. And now, let's see if we can overdub some of these, but maybe in real time, play on some additional sounds. Cool, so we'll put on the cowbell and we'll put on the rim shot or side stick. And you can also quantize from push as well, which is what I just did. I quantized push. Now, the reason why we're kind of getting through this pretty quickly, I also just paused the music from push is because we want to focus on audio today. But I did do another push work workshop a couple of weeks ago that dealt with all of this in greater detail. So if you haven't checked that out yet, please do. It's also on the 343 Labs YouTube channel. So here we go. Let's duplicate this one more time. And let's add in some hats maybe like that hi-hat over here. One thing I can do is turn on a function called repeat on push, which is on the right-hand side. And we'll relook at this again. But the idea now is that I can hold down a sound and it'll play without me having to keep pressing it. So let's record some of this on as well. Great. And I can come out of that recording mode by pressing the record button on the lower left of push again. Cool. Again, thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, I noticed some new people popped up in the, the numbers that we had. So uh, feel free to give us a holler and say hi and, and ask questions in the chat. Ooh, we had a question from Andrew. Is there a quick way to hot swap grooves from the groove pool via push? That's an excellent question. So for Groove Pool itself, I think the fastest way would still be to do it from Live itself. I don't believe that's currently an option, but that would be awesome, actually. That would be great to be able to do. There are a couple of functions that aren't necessarily optimized to do straight from push. Um, and that's because if you think about it, a lot of the time when we think when we talk about dealing with sounds from push itself, we're talking about you know, really the creative process and creating things on the fly. I feel like groove pools are, and maybe people can disagree with me on this, of course, but I feel that like groove pools are more at the arrangement stage you would go into that. And similarly to how you can't really access arrangement view from push itself, I think groove is also one of those things that really is suited more to the arrangement view when you're like fine tuning your arrangement in linear time. So I hope that answers your question, Andrew. A great question, definitely. Uh, hi, Christina, welcome. Christina is, is with us at 343 Labs as well. And um, Blank Poster, welcome as well. What are we working on? We're working on audio with push, but first we're establishing some context for ourselves uh, to begin working with audio and push. So what I have over here is a series of drum loops, which I will show you in session view, are all different. So I have a basic kick first and then we've layered on some claps and again this is available for replay so you can watch this after we're done and I've also got that going now in case anyone is curious um who's looking at my live screen I do have a track all the way to my the left of my live that says Moni that's really for me because it's for me where I'm monitoring my ears in case anyone's curious that's why whenever I speak you can see the green levels going up in that track. But we don't have to be too concerned about it. <laughs> but let's get back to this. So we currently had this drum groove growing. Let's see if we can add some chords with our uh, electric piano that we pulled up just now. Cool, let's actually try that. Let's try some. Um, cool, let's try some uh, simple seventh type of chord. So, ooh, um, Autumn West, welcome Autumn. Yes, you can control velocity from push and that's an excellent um, question. So one thing that you will notice is that for example, right now I'm touching very lightly on this and I'm going to slowly increase my velocity as time goes on. So you can actually, I'm gonna make my, my volume of this particular track louder so that you can hear it a little better. 
through it is actually possible. A great way to illustrate this was actually what I was doing just now with this repeat function on the hi-hat. So this is repeat on push and the softer I press it, the lower the velocity is and then now I'm pressing really hard and now softer. So you can indeed control velocity from push. Oh, hello, Carolyn Awesome. We have more questions. Uh, how do you know what notes you're playing? I don't understand the grid. An excellent question. Um, so this is really what's called an, an and if any if anybody is, this is jumping a little bit ahead, but if anybody in the chat or anyone watching on YouTube, which is where I currently am, um, is a guitar or a bass player, give me a shout out, my, guitars and, my guitarists and bassists in the chat, if we have any of them. Uh, or you could also be a guitar hero, which is, which is really neat. I, I, I wish I were. Uh, but the idea is that these notes are basically the layout of any scale that you would like to choose, be it major or minor. In this case, I think, I think Carolyn Awesome, you might have just joined us, but at the start of our, um, our journey today, we chose a specific key to be in, and we picked the key of F major at a tempo of 110 BPM. So now, any note that is colored the same note as my track, all of these, these are all the note F, which is the root of the key. So now, I can go up in thirds, and play scales across push. Um, so that's a really great way of being able to do these different types of shapes. Another way that I could do it is by going into what's called in-key mode on push. So the reason why some of these, um, these little pads are darker or they're not lit up is because they belong to a key that is not the key of F major. So for example, in the key of F major, we have F, G, A. And between these, there's a little F sharp, but that's not in the key of F major. So that's why it's currently dimmed out. Another way that we can do a little bit of a more condensed view and make sure that we're only playing notes in the key of, of F, really, without any, any um, leeway for other notes that are not in the key, is to go into what's called in-key mode. And this way, anything that I play is going to be in the key of F. So if I wanted to go up straight in thirds, there's my F major scale. If I wanted to be able to play a, a major chord, I'd be looking for the first, the third, and the fifth, which is... And now I can start making really great types of patterns. So let's actually keep going with this um, in-key mode. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Carolyn Awesome. Cool, let's actually try that. I'm gonna turn on my metronome also. If you can kind of hear. A loop, great. Cool. So this is kind of the, the, the reason why we're doing this is because we wanted to give ourselves a little bit of context for us to start recording audio, right? Especially because audio, more often than not, it's not necessarily just like shouting or it couldn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a clap or anything. Uh, but uh, we could, you know, even record some loops, like vocal loops of it. So these are all things that we'll start getting into. Ooh, Autumn, beginner guitarist and, and bassist. Awesome. Very cool. No, like guitaring, guitar and bass is something that I'm. I'm also glad that you act, that um, Carolyn actually brought up the question about the notes because maybe this will look familiar to you, Autumn. But the moment you start going into scale mode and you practice um, in the chromatic mode, this is actually very similar to the guitar because it's laid out in fourths. So I, I tell people the funny story of how I actually started playing guitar better because of push. <laughs> so that's always fun. Well, let's come out of it. And let's now see if we can start recording some audio. So over here I have an audio track, as you can see, and it's pink in Ableton Live, and it's also um, pink on push as well. Uh, one thing that we do notice though is that it's not really active, there's nothing coming in and out of it, so how do we actually record audio with push? The great news is that we can do this directly from push without needing to ever touch the computer um, until we get to an editing stage later, of course, which I, which I was talking about to Andrew just now. So if we go about and do this, uh, right now I'm in, in a view of push that's called mix view. What this shows me is levels of each different type of track that I have. So for example, if I were to hit play, I can see that my electric piano is that loud and my drums are that loud. I'm going to lower the volume of both for now. And I'm also going to turn off the metronome temporarily just to illustrate this for a second. 
But yeah, the idea is that we're able to see levels here. Now, what if I want to be able to control an individual track's audio in a little bit more in depth? The way we can do it is to press the mix button on the top right hand corner of push again. So I pressed it once in order to access this first view. If I press mix again, I can go deeper into an even deeper layer. So now, if I click on my drums, I see this on a per track basis on push. Same thing if I go into my electric piano. I don't see anything for the track volume on my, um, my audio track yet, and that's because we don't have an input. So now if you, you might also notice that next to here, next to the track mix um, lettering, there is another set of words next to it that says input and output. Tetro, hi. Hi, Tetro. Hi, Tetro. Tetro is our creative director at 343 Labs. Say hi to Tetro, everybody. Uh, but yeah, so right now we are in, we're in mix view um, for this particular track in Ableton Live, and we're looking at one specific tracks and we're track and we're going to take a look at its input and output so let's see what happens if we click on the soft button above it um, that says input and output and ho 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 we have a new menu uh, what is this doing it's letting us select exactly where the audio is coming in from uh, from push in a, in a particular audio track and also where it's going out from but now if I wanted to just get started and go ahead and maybe record some audio then I could go ahead and select where my audio is coming from. So in this case, just so everyone's on the same page, you can see me have this mic over here. And like I said, that's how I'm getting my audio into Ableton Live. That's why you can see the volumes going up and down whenever I'm speaking. Uh, what, I, what I'm doing is that this is connected to what I call an audio interface. Or what, not what I call it, but what is called an audio interface. And that's a bridge between any microphone and, that you might have and want to record with. Uh, or it could also be an instrument like a guitar or bass like we were just talking about. And that's connected through a cable. So over here, I have this like this orange cable that you might also be even be able to see on my push camera. Uh, and it's connected to my audio interface, which is the, the Apogee Duet for anyone who's curious in this case. So I want to make sure that I'm selecting some kind of external input to be able to put into live. And that was why we're going to look for EXT in. And there is my input channel number one, which is my microphone. A great way to test out if it's the right input or not is to just speak. If you see a green meter, it's probably the right one. And that's correct, because like whenever I don't touch it, now obviously like you can't see it. So here, uh, let's make sure that we get out of the mix menu again. I'm going to head over to device. Now, if I wanted to arm this track for recording, which means to prepare it to receive some kind of audio, all that I would have to do is hold down for a slightly longer, a slight few, I think it's more than a few seconds, uh, on the, the name of this, the button underneath the name of this audio track. So right now it's two audio, so I'm gonna hold down, and you'll notice something in live as well as on push. Great, so in live, we just noticed that the track that I just held down is now record enabled. So you can actually see the volumes going up and down, and my voice actually does sound a little bit louder. So I will head over to the mix view, and decrease this volume a little bit, maybe make it around negative eight, that's a good number. And I'll also just make sure, great. So anytime something is armed, you will be able to see it light up entirely in red. The reason why we didn't see it just now for the first time is because the sometimes push freaks out a little bit. <laughs> uh, but for most part, we will be able to see this, especially because for anyone who's curious, I'm live streaming and doing live and everything and Ableton on the same computer. Uh, so my computer's working very hard. Uh, if you want to give my computer a shout out, you can say, shout out to Claire's computer. And that's, that's a, <laughs> a great shout out. Uh, but yes. Now we have an audio track laid out here. So just to illustrate what this actually does for us, I'm going to play back our uh, little things that we had, our little loops. And I'm just going to speak, but I'm also going to press this pad on top right over here. So I'm just going to give it a press, and I'm just going to keep speaking to you as I normally would. Um, speak, 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 ha, 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 ha. Ha 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 ha
Now, this is really great because if you if anyone's seen people perform with Ableton Live before, this is essentially the way that they would go about start starting to do things like vocal loops. Or if you see people with multiple instruments, like a guitar and a bass or a piano, just like all mic'd up and hooked up, this is how they do the looping. They're using some kind of software that's more often than not Ableton Live that lets you do all of this looping together. Now, I'm going to share with everyone a technique that I usually do when I'm creating vocal loops. Um, and that's because oftentimes when I'm, as an, I'm an artist, not just as an educator at 3 Labs, but whenever I'm doing like live performance shows, I love vocal looping. I think it's really exciting. Um, it's fun to make mistakes sometimes, and it's fun to do some really neat things. So I'm going to introduce to you, everybody, a vocal chain that I use specifically for working for with audio that has vocals in it. So this is the one of the bigger parts of our push plus audio thing today. I'm going to hit uh, make sure that I currently have this track selected, which is the one of me. I keep speaking to you as I normally would. Um, speak, Great. Speak. Um, and one thing that I will do is start to add certain devices to this track. So as we recall, devices in Ableton Live are really what encompasses like the instruments the audio effects, the MIDI effects, things like that. One thing I do like to do is, is when I'm stacking and layering vocals and, and working with them, I like to make sure that I'm cleaning them up along the way. I think it helps a lot as a producer and as an engineer even to think about the way that we're capturing whatever we are singing or whatever we're playing for anyone who's not a vocalist. And you can do this straight from push as well. One thing that I will do is head back over into device view by clicking on the lower, uh, the upper right hand side, there is a word that says device, a button that you can push on push, <laughs> push on push. And you can add more devices to this by pressing add device. So that's what we're gonna do. We're going to add an audio effect that's called EQ8. And we can find this as well from push. And I'll show you one of my favorite parts about this in a second. So what you saw me do just now was add a device straight from push. And now on push, what are we seeing? We're actually seeing the uh, my vocal come in. So if I stop talking, it goes away. And this visualization visual ooh, my words, visualization is probably one of the best parts about using Live 10 with Push, <laughs> with Push 2 specifically. You won't get this on Push 1, even though they do function um, somewhat similarly. But what we want to do in this case is when I'm working with a particular vocal, I like to hear like a a, an example of what I've just recorded, not a sample, but an example of what I just recorded and use that as a barometer for finding my EQ and my compression settings for when I'm recording vocals. So I'm going to play the clip of me. I keep speaking to you as I normally would. Um, speak, speak, speak. And I'm going speak, to speak, attempt speak, speak, to speak, speak. EQ this vocal ha, 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 a little bit. Ha, 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 and we'll start off ha, ha. with a high pass filter. Would. Um, speak, 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 speak. I'm also going to decrease the volume. And hit it back to device view. The way we can do this is we can navigate into the bands of EQ. You saw that when I was moving this knob, we started passing through all the different bands of EQ on push. And I want to put on a low, a high pass filter. Excuse me. Um, speak, 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 speak. And generally, for my voice, I find that a a high pass filter around 150 is pretty good because it cuts out all of that low end. And this is something that maybe you you would like to consider if you are working with a female vocalist or a, a, a higher voice whenever you're working with this type of audio. Usually for male vocalists, because they tend to have a lower, warmer range, we wouldn't high pass them as aggressively. Usually for male vocalists, I tend to go for around, depending on how low their voice is, around like 80 hertz or around 100 hertz for frequency. But here we are, we're about 143. I'm gonna just tuck it up a little bit more. Oops, not resonance, but this. Great. Uh, now, another thing I want to do, in addition to uh, to EQ, is put something called compression on my voice. So I'm going to add another device in series behind this EQ now. And it's also going to be an audio effect called compressor. So let's put that on. Great. Also, thanks everyone for tuning in on YouTube. We had some more folks join us. Hey, hi, welcome everyone. Uh, feel free to say hi in the chat. Feel free to put questions in the chat anytime you would like to. And let's start EQing my voice. So I'm going to play this again. And I'm going to, from push, lower the threshold of this compressor. What this is going to do is decrease the difference between how loud and how soft I am throughout the entire audio track. So we're going to look for around the softest part of this. I keep speaking to you as I normally would. 
um, speak, 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 speak. And we can also <laughs> see the visualization <laughs> on push. <laughs> I keep speaking to you as I normally would. Um, speak, 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 speak. We can also increase the ratio. <laughs> I keep speaking to you as I normally would. Um, speak, 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 speak. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so one thing you might have noticed also is that now, uh, whenever I stop talking, my voice actually sounds a little different. And that's because we're hearing double of the signal of what's actually happening. So now I have my mouse, and this is probably one of the only times in this session that I will touch Ableton Live using my mouse. But I have my mouse over here in live. You might have just seen it pop up. Um, and I'm going to mute my Moni track. I'm just going to mute that. And you can actually still hear me. There's There's another version of me that's a little softer, but this is the compressed version of me that's coming in on the same track. Uh, so just just as a heads up for, for anybody who might be thinking that they're hearing double. And we'll adjust this more as time goes along. I'm going to reactivate my original self. Here is original Claire. Hello again. <laughs> and now one thing I also do like to do is whenever I'm creating vocal loops, I do like to add a little bit of some kind of interesting effect if I want it to be changing timbre. So if anything's... if ooh, Goodness. If anything, if there's anything that you take away from today, it's that a lot of the times when we work with audio, we're dealing with a couple of things. Uh, sure, we're dealing with volume, but creatively, we're dealing with time, pitch, and timbre. So I call it TPT for short. Uh, but it's, it's the three things that I love considering in general um, when we're talking about these things. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, hello. Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, I'm trying to see the, the chat. Yes, live 10 live. This is live. It's funny because live is called live. So sometimes I just like to say that I'm playing live live with live. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a great way of, of putting it. Welcome, Rafi. Welcome, Saj, uh, Sajsi, uh, 323, Regine, Brad. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so here we go. We I have our speaking thing. to you as I normally would. Um, speak, 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 speak. Great. Huh? Now, the reason why I wanted to EQ that first um, before actually, you know, moving forward with anything, is that because I'll show you a technique that from here, I'll show you a technique that I use to record different kinds of vocal loops in a in a more efficient way that's hopefully um, interesting for everyone. So one thing that I do want to do before I um, hmm, do I want to do that? Yes, I think I think I do. I do want to do that. So one thing I want to, to do before moving forward is make sure I have this track selected currently and I'm going to insert another audio track next to it. So I'm going to no actually no, we won't do that. Um if anyone is else is from is a vocalist in the chat, leave me a, a comment there and say hello because that's probably going to affect the route that we take for the next of the rest of this today. So if, I, if any of my vocalists are in, I know we have some guitarists, bassists. Um, welcome everyone again. If you're a vocalist, give me a shout out in the chat. Uh, one thing I do want to do from Push Now is you'll notice that in Mix View, I have a couple of options. One of them says volume, the top button over here, it says volume. The selection, the button after that says pen, which will allow us to pen something left and right. So that means we might hear more of it in the left ear or more of it in the, the right ear. Uh, Nefertiti Go, I think, are you a vocalist? I, I hope you are, yeah, cool. So we have volume, pen, A sends, and B sends. Now, A sends and B sends. If anyone wants to, to guess what these sends are, feel free to do so, but I'll show you what they are. <laughs> the idea is that what I, what I just did also is I showed you um, these sends in Ableton Live. I just pulled out the, I, you can hide and show the sends and returns. I just opened up the return tracks that the sends are sending to, and we have reverb and delay. So what happens now if I select, say, A sends over here on push, and I start adding some reverb? Aha, okay, great. So now we have some reverb to it. Let's see if we can put dial that back a little bit and put some delay on it as well. So here's some delay. Some delay, some delay, some delay, delay. Regine's a singer, yay! Yeah, yeah. But here you go. So now let's listen back to that silly clip of me again. I keep speaking to you as I normally would. Um, speak, 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 speak. Ha 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 ha. Great, cool. <laughs> so now that we have that going, let's see if we can find a way that, that's pretty efficient as far as this goes to record a series of loops without tiring ourselves out too much. So one thing that I will do is delete this clip. You can do that from push by holding down delete on the top left and pressing this clip. So now it's gone. But from this, you can create duplicates of this track by 
holding down the duplicate button on push and selecting what you want to duplicate. So now we have a duplicate of that. We, and if you are following along in Ableton Live, we just had a new audio track pop up that's called 3 Audio. But we notice that a couple of things are happening. It has the same, I'm hearing the, the effects, it has the same sends and returns. It has the same external input also. So we just saved ourselves all the time that we would have had to done that entire EQ compression send type of thing again. So I'm going to make a couple copies of this. Great, so now I have four of these. Uh, why four of these? It's great because then I can start recording uh, loops and stacking them together. I'm also going to go into mix view and make sure that all of these volume wise are a little bit softer. Because the moment I start stacking up my vocal, it's going to come in a lot. Now, if you remember, the way that I armed this track for recording was by pressing this button over here and holding down on it. I can also unarm it by pressing that, and now you hear me without any effects on. And I can arm the track again to activate it. So let's play back our loops that we had. So now let's try some looping type things. Cool, something simple first. So let's record it. So now I have two versions of myself. I think I sang them a little bit too in tune, so they kind of sound like they're the same, but no, they're different. This one, this is the second one. <laughs> and that's the first one. <laughs> Whoops, apologies. Should make that a little bit more out of tune. Uh, but the, <laughs> the idea is that you can stack up different kinds of vocals. So now we have like a chorusy type of, of feel to this. Uh, let's continue stacking a couple more things. Let's also arm the track that we're about to record into. And maybe some harmonies. Maybe one last layer. And if I wanted to stop everything, I could press I could press any of these lower buttons to launch an empty scene and they would all stop like now. Cool. So that was a little bit of, of, of what really kind of goes on. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat. So now we have all of these lovely types of loops. This is all good um, and, and very nice to play around with. But gee, I wish there were a way that we could continue manipulating these because it's one thing to be able to, you know, have some kind of uh, loops available for us, but if it's it's a little bit boring if we're just looping. Uh, I wish we could manipulate them in some way. I wish there were an easy way to do this from push. Haha. -ha. <laughs> so that's where uh, the power of push really comes in. So uh, remember how I had the first two tracks that were both kind of the same? Let's see if I can edit this a little bit so that the second track is playing me a little bit of something different. Now the way that I can look at um, any clip in these, like this section that I have over here of Session View and Live, is to select any of them and press Clip on the top right-hand corner to view the clip. And we'll also see the audio waveform appear for us. Now, what would I like to do for this? I would like to transpose this. So here we go. So now I have one of them an octave higher than the other. And the way I did this is also from Push. On the top right-hand corner over here, we have a couple of controls on this particular audio track that let us control the characteristics of the audio that we just recorded. So what I did was I transposed it up by 12 semitones, which is an octave. 
And I also changed the warp mode from Beats to Complex Pro. That's what we're seeing over here. If I wanted to, I could undo that by holding down the delete button over here on the left side of push and touching on that. Ooh, it's like it's not working. Ooh. Usually if you pull down delete and you press any parameter, it will reset that parameter also. So now I have these two going. And with all of my loops together, you have some kind of loop like that. Let's, but let us bring that up another 12 though. Ooh, whoops. Cool. And we'll also mix this a little, make sure this is coming down. Cool. So that's one way that you can start working with audio and push, by being able to transpose things in real time and being able to work with different kinds of sounds in that regard. Now, what else can we do on push? Well, I really like this original thing that I did just now with, you know, this, this little sampling of things. It would be really nice if I could maybe manipulate it a little bit further. So let's see what we can do. This is something that is very easily done from push, but if we look on the left-hand side of push over here, there's something that says convert. So I wonder what will happen if I, if I press that. And everyone can take a guess if you want to. I'm going to press convert, and ho ho, lo and behold, now I have more options show up for me. I have a couple of options provided to me by live in the display of push. Simpler, drum pad, harmony MIDI, melody MIDI, drums MIDI. And what this is asking me to do is what would I actually like to convert audio, this current audio piece of audio that I have into. And I'm going to press simpler and let's see what we get. Great. So we had, we just had a new track created for us. Um, if you're following along with Ableton Live, I'm also going to go ahead and close up the return tracks. But if you're following up along with us in Ableton Live, this new track just got created for us. In order to organize this better, I'm going to press shift on the lower right hand corner of push. And then I'm going to press on the title of the track and recolor it. Ooh, I love that. This is probably one of my favorite parts about Push. Uh, but I would like to color it that pink over there that's really bright. So here we go. So now this track in particular um, has become uh, a newly colored track. And now if I hit over into note view on this track, we're actually able to play it. So let's see what happens. <laughs> So welcome everyone to the world of Simpler. Simpler is a, uh, an instrument in Ableton Live that essentially is a simple sampler. So hence the name Simpler. Uh, but we can do some really great things from Simpler. For example, we can play with all of these different types of samples that we have. Um, so now, the higher we go, the faster things get. And the lower we go, the slower things get. And that's really why um, this mirrors, in a way, a lot of the traditional sampler type things that we think about. Uh, we usually think we usually associate things that have a lower pitch with being stretched out over time. This is similar to anyone who's like played a vinyl before. So if anyone is a, is a vinyl DJ or loves vinyl, let me know in the chat, because I love vinyl too. Uh, and we can talk about uh, some ways that we could possibly emulate them, maybe in a future uh, master class that I do. But for now, we have Simpler loaded up. It would be nice if there wasn't a kind of silence before I started, like, you know, playing something. There's a little bit of a delay. Now we're not immediately getting the onset of the hmm theme that I was having just now. So one way that we can do this is adjust the start time of this particular sample directly from push. There's a knob over here that says start. So that's why I'm moving the start point. And now every time I press a button, we should be starting at the exact same point. Again, let me know if you have any questions in the chat or if you want to see a specific part about working with audio, you can let me know as well. But one thing that would be nice if is, is now like, okay, it's pretty cool to have all of these different types of sounds and they're, they're you know, adjusting with how fast or how slow we're going. It would be nice if they were all somehow, you know, synced up though. I think that would be pretty nice. Um, so let's see if we can do that. What happens if we press a second time on the name Simpler? Well, we get into what's called a deeper menu in Simpler and we get to see some advanced controls. So now we see the option of warping this. And just so that we're all on the same page, warping is a type of um, process in Ableton Live that lets you conform different types of audio to the exact same speed and exact same tempo. So let's see what happens if I say warp as two bars and I think, did I press it? I did, yeah. And now 
We're kind of hearing some weird stuttery things, so maybe we need to look into some of these even deeper settings. I see a button over here that says warp side of push, that's warp, I'm going to press on it. And here, we see more information about our specific warp settings. Right now, we're seeing that our warp mode is beats, which means that live is trying to detect anything that's percussive or anything that's a beat. That's why we're getting a lot of these like little artifacts in the middle. We could change this to a, a warp mode that's called Complex Pro. And this is a mode that I generally recommend whenever you're working with audio that's, you know, like vocals or has a lot of um, different types of harmonics and different timbres that maybe you want to preserve or not, uh, depending on what your purpose is. But the idea now is that we have a much smoother type of sound to it. And if I played a chord, it's kind of all moving together <laughs> in a very interesting type of way. Cool. Now, another consideration that we might have is that this is a little bit, you know, sounding a little bit muffled and out of tune. So one thing that we could, of course, do is add some EQ and some other types of audio effects to it, um, which maybe we'll do for now. So one thing that I would like to do is add a device to this simpler track. So keep in mind that this is not an audio track anymore. Now we're dealing with a MIDI track that has had its odd, that has its contents converted from audio. So we're dealing with something that's MIDI now. But... We can put an audio effect on it, and I'm going to pull up Echo, and let's see what we get when we play Echo now. So, Cool, so let's see if we can put something in, actually. Let us go back into session view over here and trigger some of our clips that we had. Gonna adjust some of the parameters on echo over here. Oh, I think I'll try that. Didn't press, didn't press hard enough. Here we go. Now let's see if we can add a couple more audio effects to this and really turn this like sampled vocal into maybe something a little bit more like a synth perhaps. So let's add a device. Let's see. Cool. Aha. Actually, before we continue, if anyone in the chat wants to give me suggestions for audio effects to put on this, go for it. Overdrive, and let's see what we get. Drive it a bit more. And let's put a chorus on it also behind the first simpler. Audio effect, that's a chorus on it. Effects, chorus, 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 chorus. Cool. Oh dear, it looks like I just loaded up on a different audio track. That's okay. Let's put it over here. Let's add a device to it instead. See if we got any suggestions from the chat. Oh, we don't have any suggestions from the chat. That's all right. Let's wash it out a little bit more of the echo. We can go into echo and again, like pressing it, we can, pressing it twice, we can go into some even deeper settings like adding reverb. So now, if we go back into, ooh, can't see. If we go back into our session view, we have a new clip recorded here with our vocal samples, and we can do this. Cool. 
Cool. Awesome. Now, this is cool, but it would be nice if we could maybe even do a little bit more manipulation of this. So let's actually use this audio track that I had over here that I accidentally loaded up, but let's put it to good use. So if you recall what we did at the beginning of this, we looked into how we could even access the inputs and outputs from Push itself. So I'm going to go into Mix, the Mix view on the top right-hand corner of Push, and I'm going to go into the input, input and Output tab again. This time, instead of selecting an external input, what I would like to do is, let's see, what do we have over here? Select my 3-2 audio 2 track. So that's actually going to be this particular track over here. And we know this because when we start playing it, we see audio come in. We can see audio coming in from this particular track. Now we can arm this track. And again, I'm going to toggle back and forth so that you can see it. Now, there's this new blue audio track arms that we had. And we're going to do something that I call, that I personally, I call it printing. But you can call it many different types of names. The idea is that we're going to re-record the current audio that we have into this new audio track. So here we go. And then clip view, you can actually see that happening in real time, which is very cool. So now you kind of like two audio tracks going in at the same time. And this is our resampled audio in a way. Now, let's see if we can do something interesting to this. And I'm going to go back into clip view of the, for this particular clip over here. And what I will do is make sure that I'm actually looping in the right length that I want to loop in. So right now it says that I'm looping actually as a bar of five, but I would like this to be a four bar loop. And I would like us to start one bar later. So here we go. Cool. Sounds great. Now, if we select and make sure that this clip is, you know, active, one thing we can use again is the convert button. So let's convert this to this time a another simpler. So it might take a while to do its thing. Great. So now we have another simpler of, of the track that we basically just redid again. And you can do this for days and days and days and just keep going on with all of these things. But I would like to show you maybe a different type of mode. So what we were in just now was a mode of simpler that was called classic mode, which basically means for as long as you hold down the pad, you will hear it play. Now, there's different kinds of modes in simpler also. One of them is called one-shot mode, which means that hitting a button once will make the entire sample play out, which is what we're hearing now. We also want to make sure that we're currently warping this as four bars. So that way, any way that we press, the same duration, uh, the sample is going to be the same duration that plays throughout. We're also going to go into our warp settings and make sure that we're warping according to the pro mode so that we can all hear a little better. And we're going to increase the volume of this a little bit. Or I will compress it, actually. I would like to compress it. So adding a compressor, that's an audio effect. And... Compressing this over here. Decreasing the threshold to catch all of that. Cool. So let me just check. Oh, uh, we had a... Uh, Andrew said, long reverb to blend the sound into a pad. Excellent. Let's actually try it with this one. That's a great idea. And then um, Regine said, is overdrive considered a form of echo? So overdrive is considered a type of distortion. Um, um, if we're thinking about the different categories of um, factors that I was mentioning just now when I think about working with audio, we have time, pitch, and... Um, timbre, TPT. So I would say overdrive is more in the timbre category because it's dealing a little bit more of the quality of the sound. But echo, when you're thinking about it, it's like delay, delay, delay over time. So that's more of a time-based effect. But that's a great question. We'll get back to what Andrew suggested with the pad type thing. So I'm going to make sure that I've got this all. Increase the ratio a bit too. And let's wash this out into a pad. Add device. Let's put on a reverb in live. Here we go. Cool. Ooh, goodness. So here's the reverb now. 
One thing that I would also like to do is actually maybe look at my clip again, which is the, 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 um, the actually not the clip, but the sample that we were working with. So I'm going to make sure I have that track selected, I'm going to head over into note view again so that we can see the actual device. And one thing I want to do in Simpler is actually make the end of this a little bit shorter. So maybe I'm just hearing the onset of it, like the... Not even that, but maybe even less than that. Just the first note. So this is like the sampling process that we have. Cool, that's cool. Now let's go back into our reverb. And from here, let's wash this out. So now we have a little bit more of that. One thing that would be nice if it is if we had a little bit more time, a longer decay time. Ooh. And we're also very chorusy. So let's decrease the chorus on that. So now let's see what we have all together. could start layering some of some of these things in we could start like playing around with all these different types of notes one thing that I will do is layer it on a little bit more subtly in the background so I'm going to decrease the volume of this as well. Let's do that. Cool. So just so that everybody's on the same page, we're starting to use a lot of different terms to describe certain things that we are dealing with right now. Um, and Andrew just brought in some something that was called increase the attack, which is something that might be a little bit confusing for some of us who are just starting to get into electronic music and synthesis in a way. When we refer to increase the attack, sometimes we could mean two different things. We could either mean make it faster, so have a quicker attack, almost a little bit like a piano would sound, or we could say increase the attack time, which means to slowly fade in. So I think that's what Andrew was referring to here in the YouTube chat. And if anyone else wants to jump, join in and, and jump in on some of these um, chat suggestions, you are more than welcome to. Very happy to, to do this. One thing that you can do with any of these pads is change the envelope of it. And this is where we start getting a little bit more sound designy. But the idea is that we can start using different types of um, features in Simpler in order to shape the sound a little bit more. So now, I'm going to increase the I'm going to increase the volume of this a little bit. The pad that we have fades in a little bit more as compared to before. We had something that was a little bit more clickier, and you could even hear the click at the beginning. Now we have more of that stretched out. And I also, if you might have also noticed that I increased the release, so that's why we're getting more of a, a longer type of way that it's tailing off right now. So that's great. Let's get back to where we were with Simpler. Great. And yeah, if anyone has extra suggestions, uh, feel free to let us know. We'll be here for a little bit longer. And Thomas is in the chat. Everyone give Thomas a shout out. I think he's monitoring everything that's happening. So give a shout out to Thomas. I'm going to say thanks, Thomas. But yeah, we're also happy to take any other questions um, regarding any classes that we have in that regard. So. building different types of sounds. And that's just a sneak peek as to what we're actually going to do at the end. <laughs> so here we go. 
Now, if we take a look at, okay, I'm going to stop all of these clips, and I can do that, like I said, by launching a different, uh, a different empty row, a different empty scene that has stop buttons in all of them to clear all of the clips going off. And now, let's see what happens if we can do a little bit more exciting things, maybe with um, some kind, uh, this original loop that we had. We had the... And we also had, let's see what else we had. Yeah, let's actually use this one this time. Cool. So what I will do again is I'm going to make sure that particular clip is selected. And we're going to do a convert to, uh, let's do a convert to, what should we convert to? Hmm. Actually, we can do another convert to, to simpler. So maybe we can pick this one instead, this highest one. Because I think it might give us some interesting results if we do do that. I'm going to stop this as well. So make sure that's selected, and we're going to do convert to simpler. Great. So this is going to be our third conversion to simpler this time. And after this, we'll do another one that maybe might be interesting for some folks. But I'm going to color this a different color again. Let's make this one this pink. Cool. Great. So now, if I'm over here, again, same thing. We're not actually starting on the onset of the sound, so let's change that. Great. And now let's also again go in by this time we're super familiar with the idea of warping and the idea of you know changing something as to whether it's it's too long or too fast. And this should also be pro. So now what I will do is I'm also gonna make this a little bit shorter so that we are only getting one note. And we'll also make sure that in the main settings for this, uh, we're in a mode that is called one shot so that we're hearing. So I'm just like, you know, letting go. We're also going to go into the envelope section that we just looked into. And we're going to put a little bit of a longer fade out on this and maybe a little bit more of a fade in. So let's see. A little bit more. So now we kind of have like a, a different type of sound and we can even go lower. Um, by lowering the octave to play like the lowest notes that we have over here. So let's play back our entire scene of stuff that we have now. I'm going to head back over into session view and press the launch the scene. Cool. So what I did was I just launched the scene below it. That's another shortcut that you can take know that you have a scene directly below the active scene that's able to clear a specific um, scene that's currently playing. So I'm going to do that again. Let's also add a compressor to this track first, so same thing. You want to always be a little bit careful when you're working with Simpler because sometimes the levels can be a little bit different compared to what you would usually um, program in. And that's really because if we keep re-recording things as we have been doing, um, the gain staging might change between what we're recording and what we're not. So keeping in mind just at the back of your head, like how loud is this actually, um, is something good to be able to do. So now let's put in an additional device, which is again going to be our compressor. You could also, if you wanted to bump up the gain in, in total, you could also put on a utility and increase the gain from there. But in this case, I would like to compress this particular sample that we have over here. Let's put that on. into the sample and try to fine tune things or it might also be my CPU acting up which it probably is because we're running on very low latency here uh, because we want to get this to you in real time so that's why we're actually doing this right now but let's see if this doesn't work out we can just always mute the track as always that's always a useful thing to be able to do you can do this by holding down the mute button on push and pressing on that tracks name 
So again, many ways to figure out what sounds you want to include and what sounds you don't want to include because ultimately, this isn't actually a song yet. This is really the development of what could be a song and what could be a groove um, and could you know, potentially develop into a larger idea. So what I'll show you now is that now I have this entire scene of clips as you've, you've noticed me do <laughs> throughout the entire length of the session. Let's figure out some ways to arrange them because it's one thing to have all of these clips together and then it's another thing to be able to make some sense out of them. So at the beginning of this entire um, session, you'll notice that what I did was I had all of these different drum clips. Cool. and it looks like it actually is my CPU. So I'm going to take a very quick moment, everybody, and I'm just going to readjust my current buffer size. Cool. Hopefully this will be a little... Ooh, I can hear the, the difference between my actual voice and, and now what I'm doing, but that's okay. Maybe we'll delete this track. Let's see what's happening. I feel like it only came up when I started pulling up that simpler. And we'll also delete this one because we're not using it anymore. Also, yes, the more someone was, was asking me before and they were like, how many audio tracks can you have at once? Um, well, you can have many, but it also is contingent on like the CPU and what software that you're running. So now I'll just dive back in into what I was talking about. But this is how this is an approach that I would like to suggest. And you don't have to, to take this, of course. But this is one way that I sometimes think about my songs. I have all of my clips in a row together that I want to use at at the most energetic part. And then I start making duplicates and thinking about what I want to bring in when and what I want to take out when as well. So I would like to maybe keep the vocal loops for later, but I would like to make copies of them maybe in a separate scene below. So one thing that I could always do is duplicate each of the vocal loops. And I'm doing this by holding down the duplicate button, then selecting on the thing I want, selecting on, <laughs> selecting the thing I want to duplicate, and then pressing the pad that I want to paste that into. And I'm going to do the same thing for the vocal chop thing that we had, as well as this one. Um, and the chords that we had, I'm going to put them up on top as well, as a little bit down below. So now, one really great way that you can start arranging and organizing things uh, is through this manner. I usually call it the duplication uh, method for a lot of people, or for people who have followed follow me on my other social media platforms, you'll know that <laughs> I have a lot of weird words for things like duplication method, extraction, it's like lots of different types of, of ideas. But this is one way that we can start thinking about arranging songs, like which parts are exciting to hear, which parts are less exciting to hear if you're you know dealing with something else, maybe like with an audio effect. So let's see now if we can actually perform this track. I'm going to stop all clips by making sure everything is um, stopped. I just launched an empty scene, as you saw. And I'm going to head over to my device view over here. Now, this device view um, if, of, is of my master track. I currently have my master track selected, and I'm looking at a certain device that I had loaded up on it. And that's because I have a personal um, effects rack, which you can currently see in Ableton Live as well, that I use for most of my performances. I have a series of things that do things like they repeat. Thing, 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 things that I also have a high-pass filter and a low-pass filter. I have some phase that makes it phasey. I have some delay as, well. delay as well. And I have a reverb. And I have something called gray, which is a fade to gray knob. I'm going to go back to my master and get that, which is like a combination of effects. So now let's see if we can find some way to build up this particular song. So here we go. I will disappear for I'll disappear for now but I'll come back.
and that was kind of like our ooh, ooh. that was kind of like our feel good ish track type of thing. Uh, that was yeah, that was our performance of that. Ooh, I'm phasey. You can hear the phase of the ooh. cool. That's me. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much everyone for tuning in. In the last couple, in the last 15 minutes or so, I'll be taking some questions that we have, uh, as usual, in, in each of the master classes that we do for live streams. Uh, so let's take a look at the chat right now. Yeah, Thomas, whoo. Uh, Regine has a question. What is your opinion on not manipulating the vocals on the track to the extent that when you sing live, it doesn't sound like the released track? Should singers who produce just focus on special effects? Uh, that's a great question. And I think it always is on a case by case basis. Um, so very often it depends on, I think, what your vision is. So what another thing that I do outside of being an artist and an educator in general is I'm a live experience designer and um, I help people basically realize the shows and the exact visions that you want. So my answer to this is um, both, there's no wrong answer at all. It's more, it's definitely more of a preference type of thing. Uh, the benefit of having you know, all these different kinds of effects that you can kind of play with is that you can cr get really creative on the fly. But if that's not something that's up your alley, that's totally cool. Because maybe you're the kind of singer that prefers to put on, you know, a very organized type of show that is, you know, not so, not so free and is more structured because it ties in with the vision for your live performance that you want to have. So it's, it's kind of flexible in that way. And Regine, let me know if that kind of answers your question or not. Otherwise, I'm happy to clarify again as well. Um, yeah, so I don't think there's really a should singers do this or should singers not? And I think there is, if, if you are asking me though, like as, as personally speaking, uh, feel free to ask me and chat about it at maybe a next session that I'm doing on. And I'm actually going to talk about this on the 14th of April, which is next Tuesday. We are having the New York online Ableton user group. It's going to be streamed through YouTube as well. I'll be hosting it actually. So very happy that uh, to be able to do this with 343. Uh, but my segment is going to be about... Uh, producing and or not producing but building your first online show online in in parentheses because currently we're all not able to <laughs> do anything that's not online if, uh, play shows in person eventually that's the hope that we'll get back into uh, but i'll be giving people some tips and considerations that they might be able to take into account when they're planning their first long form live show that's really a show and not just you playing tracks back to back because there's a difference between the two Excuse me. So I hope that answers, answers your question, Regine. Uh, Andrew has another question. Can you freeze and flatten tracks with push? Um, so I guess my question to you, Andrew, is, uh, and if you're in the chat, uh, let me know about this. But do you feel as if freezing and flattening is more of something that's for a live performance? Or is it more something that comes to mixing and arrangement? Like, when would we need to freeze and flatten more compared to the other? Of course, we can do things like in, in different in different contexts, but when do you think it's more relevant to be able to freeze and flatten in session view or arrangement view? So that's a question that I have for, for Andrew, uh, throwing it back at you. Dwayne, uh, fus fusion rhythms, yeah, totally. It's a little bit different. I'm, I'm actually curious as to find out what this would sound like if we were increased it a bit. I could see this working as like an even like faster type of track. Um, Buck Tank has a question. Is this all being recorded into arrangement as it's being played? Not at the moment, but we totally could do that because if, if right now we're in session view and as we know when we're in session view, we have the option of pressing the arrangement record button and have things played into arrangement in that sense. You do want to be careful though because when you're working on push, if you are in note mode on a specific track, so for example, let's pull up the um, the vocal sample that we're working on. If you're in note mode and if your track is armed and if you're in the right layout, um, you will be recording a clip as opposed to recording the entire arrangement. So what, do, what exactly do I mean by this? Maybe I'll just demonstrate because this is a, is a slightly nuanced question that is important to know. But right now I have my vocal samples of everything, right? So I'm going to go into a higher octave. I'm also going to make sure that in session view all my clips are stopped. Great. And I'm going to record a, a new clip into this over here, just very arbitrarily. So I'm going to press the record button that's on the lower left of push. And then I'll start playing some notes in. So, OK, cool. So we just noticed in live that a new clip popped up. And I'll stop this. Right. So now, when pressing the record button basically recorded a new clip in particular on the note mode of push itself. 
So now let's get back into the overall session mode on push. I'm going to delete the random thing that we just created by holding down delete and pressing that pad. Um, and let's see what happens now if I stop the current transport and I just press this button over here. Oh dear, it's like at the, at the faster tempo that we had. Oh, wait, everything's fast. I'm gonna reset that tempo to <laughs> to 110, I think, was the very first first um, tempo that we had. So if I wanted to actually record this, then I need to record and make sure that my record button the, in the arrangement record section is enabled. So I'm going to stop all of these clips again, just because we don't want to be recording anything off the bat. But if I wanted to record that, then my option would be to... I'm just going to launch all of these clips now in a random order. And now in arrangement view, you can see that happening. Cool. Stop. Cool. That's a great question, though. Thank you for your question, Buckting. Yes, it was. One, it was one ten. Yes, correct. And Andrew, yes, both. I suppose. Excellent. Great. That's a great answer. And that's true. I flatten and freeze my tracks in both. Um, in both context and session and arrangement view. Uh, the answer to your question, though, is that you can mainly um, you cannot freeze tracks from push at the moment. That's also a limitation of that. Um, but I think it's actually in your best interest to do that because if you recall, what happens when you flatten or freeze a track? Let's actually see that right now. So let's see if we can flatten um, maybe a track that was giving us a little bit some problems. No, not problems, but it's taking up a little bit of, of space. So I'm going to right click. Right now I'm using my mouse again, uh, as I mentioned. So I'm going to um, right click on this track or con control click if I'm on a Mac. And I'll say freeze track. So take a look at what happens. La, 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 la. Cool, cool. So you noticed that when I had frozen the track, you couldn't actually hear me say anything. And that's because the audio engine in live temporarily deactivates. So it's actually very useful to not have that from push. Because imagine if you were trying to do that in your live performance um, and you know try to freeze things on the fly, your audio would actually go completely out. So I hope that answers your question, Andrew. And I'm going to unfreeze right now by pressing Command-Z. There we go back to normal. Uh, but yes, a great question in general. It would be nice to have the option, I think. Um, but I think it also, with that, that being said, as a live performer, I feel like it's your due diligence to be able to practice any of these things and notice in your own practice time if certain things are causing your CPU to bump up or if certain things are causing your CPU to bump a little bit less, maybe. Um, and because of that, because you're practicing for your performance and you're not going in blind, you're able to prioritize as to what is more important to have that may or may not be co contributing to your CPU. Uh, so that's my, my personal take on it as someone who's done a lot of live performance. But thank you for your question. Uh, Autumn has a question as well. What's your favorite feature of push from a producer's perspective and then from a performance per perspective? Ooh, lots of peas. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, as a producer, I think my favorite pe feature of push is... Hmm. I do like a lot of the simpler type things that happen on in there. And, and even though today's focus was more on like, okay, here we have an audio thing and we record it. I'll just show you this very quickly. But if I stop all the clips and let's add, let's add a new track and hopefully this will not kill everything. <laughs> cool. Let's put this track over here. I'm going to put a, a, up a new, uh, move my mic. I'm going to pull up a new MIDI track and we're going to put, the empty simpler device on it. Simpler, simpler, simpler. Is it going to be an instrument? It's going to be all the way down. Great. So simpler. If you were to just use this with, say, any kind of song that you have, or maybe a type of sample that you had, and I can't see, so I'm just going to move myself a little bit. Uh, you could then go into, you know, say something like your collections or packs and stuff like that, and you could even pull in a sample directly from. Um, here as well. So let's pull on, um, let's see. Yeah, maybe find something. This is the Beat Tools pack from Ableton, uh, which should be available for download as well. I'm going to put on maybe a, a piano loop of some kind. Cool. Maybe I'll try that. Load that in. So now, if I come out of browse, I can pull this 
was what we did just now. Uh, one of a really cool um, type of feature that I like to use sometimes when I'm in Simpler is the, the manipulation of something that's called glide. So it's the ability to slide from one note to another. And you can also play with glide time. So for example, if I'm, oh, I forget that my mic is here. For example, if I'm playing this. <laughs> can like slide between different notes. I think from a production perspective, that's something that I really like. Um, as a producer though, I pretty much like um, all of Push as a whole. I think the fact that every you can pretty much do anything from Push is really great. Um, but one thing that one feature that I do like on Push very much is the, the integration with Capture in um, live, so that's the idea that it's able to capture any of the tempos or the, the patterns that you play. So for a second, let's head back over into our um, little drum kit that we had just now. So we had this, we have everything, right? I'm going to make sure that repeat is off, and maybe I'll just see if I can play around in a little bit and um, we'll see what happens. So I just recorded that little ditty. I, I actually really liked it, uh, but what a shame I didn't. I actually didn't record it. I, I correct myself. I just played it. Uh, now, if you if you go on to push and you hold down the record button and then press new, live will have recaptured your idea, and you just need to be able to crop it in the right place. And it's also redetected the tempo as eighty four. And you can crop this clip, and there's your new loop. So now everything is playing back at 84 BPM. So that's something that I quite like, and both performance and production, actually. Thanks for your question. Uh, does anyone have any final questions, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, that that was not that is not changed for performance settings, unfortunately. I think it's because if you if you think about it, and this is actually something in the Ableton Reference Manual version ten, uh, they give you a, a bit of a deeper dive into what exactly goes down when you freeze and flatten a track, and that's because Live is doing a process of basically preserving exactly what you created, and it's taking some time to be able to do that. So as a result, you're not going to be able to to hear um, whatever you've been doing. They do a much better um, job at explaining it than, than I'm doing right now on the fly, uh, but that's definitely something that you can look into. Uh, any final questions? Oh yes, thank you, Thomas, for putting that in. Um, we will also, yeah, we will be having a couple of weekend workshops and the new Ableton Live workshops, I'm, cur I'm currently teaching a few of them. Uh, one of them that's, that I'm, I won't be teaching this time, but we have a new workshop that starts on Sunday and on Monday, I believe. Um, and you can learn Ableton Live with a ton of really great um, teachers and instructors and a good number of Ab Ableton certified trainers as well. Uh, there are four of us in at 343 Labs overall, which is, I think, the uh, largest per capita <laughs> in any institution. And I think 343 is also, 343 is, and not I think, but I know that it's an Ableton certified training center. So you can get really good quality Ableton Life education from us, which is something that we enjoy um, creating and, and doing and, and giving people nice experiences. So yeah, let's stop that clip over there and stop transport from push. Uh, yes, you're most welcome, Autumn. Uh, great questions from everybody. So we thank you for that. Um, any last words? from anybody. Uh, otherwise, I think my last word, if I could have a last word, which I, 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 I guess I am now since I'm streaming, is that again, on Tuesday, next Tuesday, April the 14th, we are having the New York Ableton user group online. So if you want to head over to 343labs.com slash events for more information, the more information is going to be available online. We have three amazing uh, presenters, rather two and then one okay presenter. <laughs> we have we have Brian Funk, who's also another Ableton certified trainer. Maybe some of you know him as Afro DJ Mac formerly. Great um, producer and great um, sound designer and educator. Someone I look up to very much and he's going to be doing a presentation at the user group. We also have a presentation from Sesame, who's a producer. Um, as That's S-E-S-A-M-I-I. -I. Um, she's an amazing melodic bass producer, great sound designer as well. And she works with um, different types of audio and is going to be breaking down one of her remixes for us. That was an award-winning remix um, from Symbionic, who's another producer who I, I like a lot. So she won their, his, his remix competition for one of his albums. Uh, so she's going to be breaking down her award-winning re remix, so I'm very excited about that. And then I'll be doing my, my presentation, like I said, uh, about how to build your first 
online in brackets live show. And eventually when, when we get back to doing stuff in person, I would love to do a proper thing about how to build your first live live show because there's a ton of other considerations that we don't think about think about in one context versus the other, other context when we're all like staying at home. Uh, so yeah, no problem. Thanks everyone for coming by. Once again, my name is Claire. I also go by Daltrick. That's D-O-L-L-T-R exclamation point C-K in all lowercase letters. Um, so if you can't find me, it's usually because sometimes there's a misspelling. So it's D-O-L-L-T-R exclamation point C-K. Um, you can also call me Claire, especially if I teach you. Dal Don't call me Daltrick, please. <laughs> if I'm teaching, Daltrick is like my artist side of stuff who does a lot more of the push-related type things. But thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll see all of you next time, and I'll see some of you in class. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Bye.